Well, good evening. You're on Street Talk with Father Russ, and tonight I have uh, Tambria, my co-host, is with me, and my great friend Bobby Delello is beside me, and we're going to get to to Bobby in a minute. We're going to talk about some stuff. Okay, I have to congratulate you Democrats. Okay, this was the first time in my life I voted for a Republican, and of course, he lost. Okay, but what can I say? I don't, I don't necessarily agree with the, what's going to happen, uh, but however, the greatest thing that, that happened to me was to see so many that got out to vote. That is probably the most important thing that happened. And here in London, over 12,000 people, uh, great to go to the polls and see multiracial groups there for the first time in my five years here was amazing. And new voters, it was wonderful. However, I'm very sorry that you didn't want me as a dictator, and uh, the mayor thing didn't go through. Only 300 votes, and you could have had me as a dictator. However, or you could have had Mike, but Mike says he doesn't care. I heard uh, in, the, in the paper, I read in the paper that, oh, gee whiz, the vote is in, and I guess we're back to... New London as usual. At its finest. As its finest. So uh, congratulations, though, to everybody who got out there and went, and, and Obama, the greatest thing in history, obviously. We finally got through the racial barrier, and uh, we're with this whole civilized world now, and uh, leaders can be any color and come from any place, and that's the greatest thing, if you Just want. Just not a woman. Not yet. Not yet. Next time. Maybe. Next time, maybe. Who knows, right? Uh, as long as it's not Sarah Palin, poor thing. Well, she's getting trashed more than anybody. But tonight, tonight, uh, all kidding aside and everything else, the, the election is probably the most important election in my lifetime that's going on. And the changes that may or may not happen, we're hoping a lot of the changes that uh, Obama is for, uh, I look forward to seeing, and I hope that the focus is on the middle class and the poor for a change, uh, which that'll be a great change. Uh, probably the last time that happened was uh, FDR. Uh, so uh, we'll, we'll see what happens. However, um, what I do want to talk about, and, and the reason I have Bobby, Bobby's been on with me before, uh, and, and uh, I want to talk about the re- uh, pre-release problem. Uh, here in Connecticut, the prison overcrowding, and uh, what it means uh, to uh, re-entry. What does it mean? When does it start? Because we have people coming out, and uh, there's no jobs, and there's no way they can do things. And uh, I want to discuss that issue and what we should do about it. So, uh, oh, one other thing I do want to I, I do want to plug the book. Uh, I do want to play. When the prison is ran, Walpole, I really do want to. Uh, Bobby's one of the authors of this, contributing author to this, our friend Ralph Hamm uh, and uh, Ed Rodman, Cannon Rodman, for those of people who've been around New London. Uh, Cannon is on Father Emmett's board. And, of course, Jamie Bessonette, who did the great work to put this together that I thought in my lifetime I would never have seen. Okay, this is, a, this is an academic book. It's not about, gee, my life in the prison. It's about organizing in prison, the politics around it, and everything else. It's a, it's, a, it's a book that if you're interested in the justice system, if you're interested in what's happening in prisons and the failing system and what to do about it, this is the book to read. So, Bobby, is that book on tape yet? I don't think so. I really can't say positively because I really don't know, but I don't recall hearing anybody saying that. Okay. So I, I, think, I don't think it is. But see, the important thing about this book is it's like a history book. And what you really need to know is that at that time, this was around 71, Walpole Prison had a murder rate of, in an 18-month period, 20 people were killed. Most violent prison in the country. It was one of the most violent prisons in the country. And we got a black commissioner of corrections. At the time, we had the uh, school busing situation in Boston. All right? And uh, the guards went out on strike, anticipating a bloodbath inside the prison so that they could blame this commissioner Boone and get him thrown out. And people like kind of miss that is that, you know, first-degree murder, premeditated malice aforethought. If anybody got killed, 
then that's what you did. Mm -hmm. You committed first degree murder. Your job, and by law, you can't go on strike. But you did. And the anticipation was that there was going to be a bloodbath. To bat. set someone up for failure. Exactly. And, and set people up to get because killed. Because of the color of killed. their skin? Well, no. It was just uh, uh, they anticipated a bloodbath. What they didn't anticipate they thought the was that we riot. ran the prison right. for yeah. 12 weeks without guards. Right. Right. I mean, we ran the kitchen. We ran the shops. Mm -hmm. We ran everything. It took the counts, did the whole bit. Right. And clearly demonstrated that, uh, gee, we really didn't need these people and all their insanity. But the beauty of this book here is it's a history book, all right? And it's well documented. And what it really demonstrates here is that prisons don't work. They cannot be reformed. And you really have to read the book to get the holistic picture. The politics is in there. Politics all the games that, are, that were played are in there. And you could see that the state had the opportunity to turn prisons around and rehabilitate people. The prisoners were all on board. And then the politics being politics, they sold out on everything and uh, everything folded. But it just demonstrates you that you cannot reform prisons. They're wrong in concept, they're wrong in application, they're wrong to their core, they do not work. And the more you try to make them work, the more they're not going to work. However, some of the things that come out of this experiment when this happened and what was said then and some of the programs that were done at that time were seriously working and things were done. So that when we talk about, this is what I want my listeners to understand, we're talking about the way that these kinks can work. We believe, I believe, and I know Bobby believes, that we know how to change the justice system around to take people who've been made mistakes like we did, train, turn them around, and re reintegrate them into society as productive okay, people. Okay, but Father, here's the thing. Right. Rehabilitation works. Right. That's the bottom line. You can rehabilitate people. The problem is... The Department of Corrections do not have a vested interest in rehabilitating prisoners. It's like the whole problem with privatized prisons. If you were the superintendent of a privatized prison, came up with the best rehabilitative program that you could reduce the recidivism rate to near zero, the shareholders would have you fired. What do you mean you're going to rehabilitate the product? Well, let's talk about the prison as, as a corporation, as a business, who is benefiting from the existence of, the, of Walpole, say, in Massachusetts? I mean, obviously, we have food service. We have, we have local food suppliers. We have national food suppliers. We have industries that are benefiting by its existence, industries that work with metal, obviously, industries that work with um, everything from... from um, when you, get Wiring, into the, okay. when you get into the prison industrial complex, you're talking about a huge, huge right. concept. But you can narrow it down pretty much to the idea that guards and staff. It's not corrections is not about corrections. Corrections right. is about job security. Right. And that's the problem. And and if you rehabilitate prisons, by Massachusetts there is a statute mandating the Commissioner of Corrections to rehabilitate prisoners. If that happens, what ends up happening is the recidivism rate reduces the amount of prisoners, which means you need less and less guards, which means that at a certain period of time, you need fewer and fewer prisons. And all the money that gets saved can go into other stuff. This is what they're against. This is their job security. Their cousins, aunts, uncles, brothers, and what have you. Nepotism is unbelievable in the correctional system. And this is the problem. And there's no way to fix it. 